Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome to the East Brunswick Public Library. We have a wonderful audience here tonight. Thank you all for turning out. And we have a very special event. We're going to be celebrating the life, times, and music of a homegrown East Brunswick son of the sod. Mr. Rick Polari is celebrating his 50 years as a rambling, dedicated folk musician. Please, a rousing applause. Uh, before, I'd like to just, at the outset, just thank Melissa and the tech people for putting all this together. Um, I understand there's going to be a high school reunion this week, too. Not this week, but later on. Okay. In September, we okay. have our, our big 50th from all the right, class well, of seven. And there's a lot of people here from... 1973. Is there is there any one or two people in particular who'd like to have them stand up and take a bow? Uh, the, the teacher, maybe? Yes, I'd like uh, Chris Christensen to Chris stand Christensen. up. Chris was the team teacher with Winona Mason and a supporter of my world for a long time. And yeah. I appreciate her being here. Now, you are from, you did grow up in East Brunswick. Yes, I did. Uh, and here we are at the East Brunswick Public Library. Yes. Uh, as a, a longtime journalist, I like to, I'm always interested in the full circle moment. Hmm. This is a full circle moment. It it's is. 50 years, yeah. you started here, you've been all around the world, mm -hmm. and now you're back again. You, you feel the, the gravity pulling at your heartstrings tonight? Uh, well, I, I think, I, you know, it makes you uh, realize the journey that you've been on, the journey, the journey because you, you remember, you know, being that young person who had a dream, that, you know, and didn't have a plan, had a dream, but didn't have a plan of how in the world does somebody become a folk singer? I mean, there's no, thing, like, you can't go to, to like, Berkeley to be a folk singer. No, you, you, you can't, you, you know, there's no kind of a course uh, 101 on being a folk singer. You know, it's something that you have to find, and that's part of the journey. And so I think that's the exciting part for me is to realize that as I look out here and I see different, different people who are part of that journey, especially in the early days when we would have the little hoot, hoot nannies in my basement, and, you know, and Dave Jacob would sing songs with his brother, Neil, and, you know, and all of these wonderful people that are in the room and the exit band that played, uh, that I carried their equipment. You know, that was the wake up call. I think that's what got me into playing acoustic music. It was just carrying those heavy, heavy amplifiers. <laughs> <laughs> that might do it. <laughs> well, you, you didn't have a plan, but you figured it out as you went along. Step by step. I think, but, but the thing is, you have to have mentors. You know, it, the, the, the idea is you can have the dream and uh, even without a plan, if you have mentors that you can learn from. And that's what made the difference in my life, Michael, is you know, meeting Pete Seeger at the age of 19 years old and becoming friends with Pete was the beginning of the fantastic journey because I had someone to emulate, you know? I had someone who was uh, such a, a, a really interesting person. And, and uh, to think that if I was, you know, when I was 15 years old, dreaming about, you know, playing music, there was a moment, you talk about a moment that you had that, that really crystallized uh, everything is, when I was doing this project, uh, recreating a tour that Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie did in 1941, that was 10 years ago. And I interviewed Pete uh, two different times, once at his house, which I had done many times, but we needed another interview. And we did it in, in my Toyota pickup truck. And, and uh, it was funny because his daughter said, well, Pete doesn't have a lot of, you know, he's, he was 94 years old at that point, you know? And uh, he didn't have a lot of time, you know, where he could really think. So his daughter, Tina, set up the idea, well, he had to go to a chiropractor appointment and his wife had to go, but he had to wait around for her to get done. And it would be maybe about two hours. 
So instead of him just sitting around, that's a good time to do the interview. So I was sitting in the parking lot and he pulls up and he jumps inside right next to me, sitting in the, in the, uh, my pickup truck and we're talking and, uh, you know, I'm asking the, these different questions. And I said, Pete, you know, this album, it says dedicated to the memory of Joe Hill. Why did you do that? And Pete goes, well, Rick, you know, Joe was a good songwriter. Oh, the workers on the SB line said strike without a call. And he starts singing. And we're sitting in my pickup truck, singing this old union song together. And I was saying to myself, I could never imagine this moment when I was young, that I'd be sitting in my pickup truck, singing with Pete Seeger. <laughs> and that was like, it, it showed me that, that moment. And that also was, I believe in creative visualization. I, I do a lot of thinking uh, about how things come together. And when I was 15 years old, and I was thinking about Pete, I wrote him a letter. I had this vision in my head that someday that we would sit and play music together at his house. I don't know why, but I had this vision in my head. And it turned out to be so real because when it happened i was sitting there we're sitting and we're playing music at his house together and it was this is the very image i've had in my mind since i was a little kid so this is pretty amazing there was a plan <laughs> i guess I, you know but, but then again you know the, the plan that i've been on has been so crooked that no one would be, be able to follow it no 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 worries now there's there's different ways to mark the start of your journey. Now I'm going to I'm going to pull something out of the hat. You mentioned this to me once. I guess it was either in the late 60s or early 70s. You said you attended a special concert not far from here at the chapel at Douglas College. Mm -hmm. What was that? Tell tell us about that. Well, you know, I was still in high school and I had heard I never saw Pete Seeger. I heard that he was playing at uh, Douglas College. And uh, I had really long hair back then. I've always had long hair, but it was really, really long hair. A hippie. And, uh, yeah, I guess you could say that. And uh, and I did what any anybody of my age would do if they wanted to see a good music thing. I, I played hooky. It was the best day of hooky that I ever had. I, uh, I hitchhiked over to uh, Douglas College, and, uh, and I was able to get in because I kind of looked like all the other long-haired kids that were in there. And... Uh, and, and Neil Jacob was in that concert too. And he was, I didn't know that, but he, he, he also played. <laughs> and Dave was there, you know. So here was these East Brunswick High School kids, but they didn't play hooky. They, they got permission or something. But anyway, so I, I got in there and I'm sitting there and I'm watching Pete. And he puts out his hand like this and, and the whole room starts singing. It fills with song. And this is honest, I'm telling you the truth. My body filled with light. I felt this energy filling my entire body with this bright light. And I heard this sound like, this is what I want to do with my life. And that was the moment. That was the moment. Now you also met Pete Seeger in Hoboken mm -hmm. in the early to mid seventies. Yes. Uh, there's a story there. Now this is a real funny story. This is true. All right. So, you know, I'm, I'm on this journey. I've seen Pete in concert. I have not really met Pete yet, all right? I mean, say hello. I mean, that was about it. And um, my sister, uh, who's 11 years younger than, than me, she was watching Sesame Street, and she would watch Pete Seeger. And every time that Pete would come on the screen, she would let me know, Pete's on TV, you know? And so when she found out that Pete was going to be playing at Central Park with Arlo Guthrie, uh, they, my mother and the, the two young girls, my, uh, Tina and, and Lisa, they all went to Central Park to look at the museums. And meanwhile, they saw everybody setting up all of these blankets. So Lisa says, what's going on? And somebody tells her, well, Pete Seeger and Arlo Guthrie are playing today. Now my sister 
starts thinking, well, Rick, he listens to Pete Seeger. He's got the book. He's got the band. He must be friends with Pete Seeger. I think that he must be backstage with Pete Seeger right now. And she goes over with Tina, and they go over to the person who's guarding the gate. And this is no lie. She, she said, my brother's backstage with Pete Seeger. Can you take me there? The guard sees these little kids there, brings them backstage. And sure enough, they go into the trailer where Pete and Toshi are. And uh, I don't know what happened, but whatever took place there was magical because she spent some time with Pete. They were talking. And uh, she told him that I was a good banjo player. <laughs> and uh, I went to the concert that night. And Pete Se Seeger says, well, tomorrow we're going to have a big festival for the Clearwater in Hoboken, New Jersey. Everybody's invited. I'm all excited. I get my banjo. I put it on my back. I'm heading out the door. And Lisa said, did you know that Pete Seeger files his nails? I said, what? <laughs> I had no idea about this meeting. So I go over to the festival, and there were a few young people, like myself, playing some music. Who comes by but Pete? He takes out his big 12-string guitar, and he's playing along with us. I am in shock. I'm like, Pete Seeger is playing music with me. I couldn't believe it. And I was up there playing, and the music stopped, and Pete looked at me and said, I haven't seen you before. Who are you? And I stumbled out. Uh, uh, I'm Rick Polari. He said, Rick, I met your sisters yesterday. <laughs> I said, what? He said, I met your sisters yesterday. They told me you were a good banjo player. Why don't you come up on stage and we'll play a song together? And Pete brought me up onto the stage. And my life totally changed from that moment. It was like... Boom, Technicolor, like the moment of Wizard of Oz, you know, when Dorothy <laughs> opens the door. It was never the same after that moment. But it was a fluke. It was just, just a fluke. Well, you dreamed it. Now, not only were you a good musician in your early days here in New Jersey, but you also got the reputation of being a go-to impresario. You were an organizer of musical events and festivals such as a festival that took place in Perth Amboy. And how is it that it's like not every baseball player is a good manager, not every musician is a good organizer of events. How did all that come about? Well, it's, it's, Pete gave me the marching orders. I was talking to him on the phone. He said, Rick, he said, Perth Amboy's got a good harbor. It would make a really good festival. Why don't you put one together? Now, I didn't know anything about putting together a festival. And uh, I, I went over to Mayor Outlowski, who was the mayor of, of Perth Amboy. I had my denim jacket on, and I walk in there, and he stops me and he goes, nobody comes in here without a tie. And I said, I'm sorry, Mayor. I said, if I had a tie, I might have worn one, but I don't, I don't have a tie, but I've got, I've got an idea. And he said, well, why don't you tell me? And I told him this idea about this festival that we could have right there in Perth Amboy, right on the waterfront. And we would bring the clear water in, and Pete Seeger would eventually come. The first year he didn't come, Harry Chapin came. Uh, and, uh, and it might do good things for the community. And he let me do it. The mayor of, of, of Perth Amboy said, well, you have to work with the steam, Steve Bandola, who was our recreation head. He said, if you work together, I'll let you put on this festival. And that's how that happened. And then there was another big festival that you put on, even bigger, I think, than Perth Amboy, the Raritan River Festival. That was a celebration of New Brunswick's, uh, one of its big anniversaries. Well, there was a, a professor named Professor Babcock. And he was, uh, he had this dream of this festival on the river. And uh, it would have all these floats on it. And he was having a hard time. He was having a hard time getting people to, to believe in his idea. And he came to a, a, one of the Blueberry Festivals, and he wrote me this long letter, and then he wanted to talk to me. He wanted to meet me, and he wanted me to get involved with the committee. So I got involved with the committee, and we worked out an idea that Pete Seeger would come to 
that, that vessel. And Bob Yan, who, who's over there, helped out with the, with the very first, uh, first one. We had the big stage, the big state stage come in. We had a, a pipe band, a full pipe band uh, come in. And Pete did Amazing Grace with a big Scottish pipe band. And it opened up the door for that festival to, um, to be a regular event. And it, that, that one took place at least, I, according to my notes, at least four years in a row? I think, I, is it still going on? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, but it ran for a long time. And Bob, Bob was, you know, when I moved to Vermont, Bob was uh, really in charge of keeping things. You know, here I was about, you know, I had my banjo. And I was trying to learn how to play the banjo. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like it was years ago where, I mean, it wasn't like it is today where you could go onto YouTube or you could go uh, put on a video. There were only two books at, at those days that had banjo instruction in it, Pete Seeger's book and Earl Scruggs. Uh, and um, the only way you could really learn how to play the instrument was to find somebody who could play it. So I was in high school and I was thinking about, you know, um, where am I gonna, where am I gonna learn the banjo? And I heard about this place called Albert's Cabin. Albert's Cabin down in the Pine Barrens. And um, so I convinced a friend of mine, his name was Dwayne, and Dwayne had a mandolin and I, I told uh, Dwayne that, uh, that he could play it. <laughs> and he was just learning how to play. And we, we hitchhiked down to, um, down to where, to, we, to Mount Holly. And we went into a music store. We were in the music store and um, we we're talking about, we, we're trying to get to Albert's cabin. And the guy says, oh, that's great. He goes, I'm going there tonight, I'll take you along. So we're really excited about going to Albert's cabin. We get in his car, he starts driving, he comes to the New, New Jersey Parkway, and he takes a turn and goes on the opposite direction of the traffic and darts into the woods. Now, we just met this guy. Now, our little hearts were going pitter patter, like, who is this? What are we doing? Now we're driving down this dirt path through the Pine Barrens, and I'm saying, he could be an ax murderer. I don't know, I just met this guy, you know? Who is he? And we're driving through and there's all these abandoned uh, washing machines. And now I said, I know any minute he's gonna stop the car and he's gonna kill us. I just know it. And we came to a point where there was a broken glass in a tree and the, our headlights flashed by. I said, that's it, I know he's gonna come out. And then I heard the sound of music. And there it was, out in the Pine Barrens, Albert's cabin. And there were two people sitting on the porch. And they both had banjos. One was an old guy, and one was a young guy. And I took out my banjo, and I joined in. I was, I was playing along a song I knew. And everybody's having a good time as we're playing Crip Creek. Everybody's smiling. And the old guy goes, Hey, my name's Sam Hunt. I've been living here in the Pine Barrens all my life. I've been making bands. I make bands all, and I send them all over the world. And I take the wood and I keep them underneath my bathtub. If you come over to my house, I'll show you all the wood that's underneath my bathtub. And I'll show you all the banjos that I made. This guy talked fast and furious. I never heard anybody talk as fast as Sam Hunt. And then he said, now we're gonna play the old Joe Clark. You know that one? I said, no, I saw it in the book but I don't know how to play it. And he slowed down and he said, oh, let's, let's learn it right now. He said, take your finger and slide it down the string like that. Can you do that? I went, he said, good. He said, put one finger behind the other on the first string, uh, second uh, fret and third fret and pluck it off. Can you do that? And I went, he said, put them together. He said, good. He said, now hit the open first string open second string, third string, and open third. Put it together now. Can you do that? Good. He 
please start to play a little bit faster. So you, you can tell them about it. All right. So what? My mom being from Poland. I saw a picture of a Polish bagpipe uh, in a National Geographic magazine. And uh, I, I thought that, boy, that, that's an interesting instrument. I never, I never saw anything quite like it. I cut out that picture. I can pull this up. It's, it's, a, it's not an easy thing. You got to get yourself all situated here, um, so that you can learn about it, because it's very rare. The instrument itself is rare. It's hard to find information about it. It's hard to play it, and the only way to really learn how to play it is to go. So I saw this picture in National Geographic magazine. I cut it out and I thought about it. That I'd like to learn how to play this instrument. And I started writing to people. And they all thought I was joking. You know, they thought this Polish bag like, was some sort of joke. And um, but finally one of my letters did get to the right person. And I was invited to Poland in 1980 to meet with some of the last of the Polish pipers. And one of the people that I met there was Yusuf Broda. Now, Yusuf Broda is a master bagpiper and one of the best pipers in all of Poland. And, um, you know, when we first met at this festival, he said, we don't teach bagpipes to tourists. No, if you are sincere, you must come to Poland and live here and teach us like and so I, I went away with that idea that the only way to really learn, I was able to get a, a bagpipe, but if I was going to learn it, uh, I, it I, I wouldn't be able to, to do it very easily. And uh, I came up with this idea of a grant. They give grants for everything. So I thought I would get a grant to learn how to play Polish bagpipes. So I started writing to all kinds of people and getting all kinds of rejection. I even wrote to the Hillshire Kabasi Company. They didn't give me the grant, but they gave me a coupon for a free year of kibasi. No joke. And, uh, and then I found out about the Kostyshko Foundation that gave fellowships for intensive study. And I called upon Chris Christensen, who was my music teacher, uh, for a reference. And she was able to uh, give her reference. And Pete Seeger gave his reference. And with that, they gave me a fellowship to live in Poland in 1984 under communism and learn how to play this old instrument. Now, this instrument is very, very finicky somehow. So we'll see. Let's see how you do it.
the back, I found like. So I lived in Poland in 1984 and part of 85 and learned how to play some of these instruments. And the thing was that back then, everything was rational. And so you couldn't find a lot of instruments. But my teacher, Yusuf Broda, one day took me out into the woods and we picked up this, the stick from the forest. We brought it home and waited until it got dried out. And he took an old fashioned hand drill and he slowly twist and turn and twist and turn all the way through till he made it to the other end and put a cap in it, made a little slit and a thimble at the end. And this is an instrument that don't, you don't have any finger holes in it. Does anybody have any questions for Rick? Because I think it's a good time for him to come up on stage and tell some stories and play some music. So if there's any questions, I'll repeat the question so the people out in the internet world can hear it. So any questions for Rick? Or would you just like him to come up and uh, start playing some music? I think that would be nice. So yeah. okay. I am now going to become a member of the audience. Thank you All very right. much. So when I was traveling around and learning about the flute, the uh, Kevin, so this is, this is a type of a Native American love flute or a courting flute. And uh, it has a story about how it came to be. This is something that Kevin taught me while we're sitting in a sweat lodge together. He said, long ago, there was a young boy and he was in love with this girl. But he was very shy, and he never had the words to tell her what he felt in his heart. So she ignored him. 
Well, he became so sad, he wandered out into the woods. And there he saw a big bull elk. And that elk brought him deeper into the forest than he had ever been. Led him to an old cedar tree. Now the tree was so old that its branches were hollow. And a magical thing happened is the woodpecker landed on a branch and started pecking a hole into the branch and flew away. And the branch broke off, started sailing down through the sky and a gust of wind rushed through it and it played a beautiful melody. The boy picked up the magic stick. He brought it back to the medicine man to ask him what it meant. He said it was a gift from the great spirit and should be used in our love or according traditions. And he asked the boy to play it. So he blew into it. And he noticed that everyone had stopped what they were doing and all gathered around him. And that young girl that he was in love with, she was right next to him. And she had a big smile on her face and he did too, but none of the young boys were smiling. They said, where'd you get that magic love flute from? So I told him about the old tree in the forest and the woodpecker and the big elk. And so all the boys, they went over and broke off branches and made love flutes of their own. And from that time, whenever a young boy, especially on the, the uh, Sioux tribe, fell in love, he'd have to make up a song for the girl that he loved. And if she liked it, that meant she liked him. And uh, so here's an idea of what one of those songs might sound like. <laughs> traveling, doing these school shows all over, all over the lower 48 to every state. And as I was traveling, I stayed with, at a lot of Native American reservations. And I wanted to learn about storytelling. And as it turns out, sometimes the thing that you're looking for is right where you live. And that's what happened. I went from this big odyssey around America and came home to Vermont and there was this wonderful storyteller named Wolf Song. And I asked Wolf Song, I said, Wolf Song, can you teach me how to tell stories? He said, I will if you teach me how to play the flute. So we became friends. I was showing how to play the flute. He was telling me how to tell some stories. And then poor Wolf Songs, he passed away. And uh, people stopped thinking about him. They, they just, you know, even though he was really well known, they start talking about him. And uh, I thought that I had to write a song to honor him in the traditional way. So I went out to Snake Mountain, a mountain that's not too far from my home. And that's where they had scattered his ashes at the top of Snake Mountain. And I was thinking about when he would tell a story, if he was telling a long story, he had to make sure you didn't fall asleep. So he would say, hey. And if you were still listening, you went, ho, try that. Hey, oh, you're still awake. And I was thinking about it, and I heard that in my head. Hey, ho, hey, ho, hey, ho, hey, ho. On Snake Mountain, in the Vermont Hills, high above the rocks and rills, after midnight, when the moon's in spring, you can hear the wolf song sing. Hey, ah, 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 hey, hey, oh, oh, oh. Hey, ah, 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 hey, hey, oh, oh. That's your part. Want to try it with me? I'll slow it down a little bit. Hey, 
And then you kind of sing it back like this. It's an old, old song. We are, say, we are climbing, climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are. Brothers, sisters, oh. every new rock makes us stronger. Every new rock. Stronger every
much time do we have a bit of time yet good this song here can you hear me all right is it coming through okay i'm not sure if it's please play it okay Now this song I wrote from a, when I was down in a hobo jungle. And I was there with uh, one of the kings of the hobos. And his name was Frog. Now Frog got his moniker or his nickname, how he used to leap onto a moving boxcar. Now Frog's not doing too well and all the old hobos are worried he's gonna catch the westbound. Now, when you catch the westbound, you get that little last train ride up to heaven. You don't want to catch the westbound if you can help it. Well, I was going over to England, and I got an email from my hobo pals. They said, old frog had caught the westbound. I felt so bad, I wrote a song, and I emailed it in. A few days later, I got an email back. They said, oh, we had a big party for frog out in St. Paul, Minnesota. All the hobos were there, and they were reciting poetry of their dear fallen comrade, when right in the middle of the festivities, they got a telephone call from, guess who? Frog. And Frog's wondering, well, there's a big party going on, and he wasn't invited. He said, Frog, we thought you were dead. He said, dead? What do you mean, dead? I was robbed. What do you mean you were robbed? I was walking down the street, and somebody lifted my wallet stole my identification. Then they went around pretending they were me. They even went out to a bus out to North Dakota and died, and the police thought it was me too. They started calling everybody up and telling them that I'm dead. Well, I'm here to tell you that I ain't dead. But now the good thing is, I know exactly what my funeral's gonna be like. I live my life as a hobo. My only home is a soul train. I've been a frog and a king. Lord, I've done everything. Now I'm riding on that westbound train. 
let jungle fires burn wild and free and pass my bottle around. Let the train whistle blow. Tell the old bows I'm a riding on the westbound. I slept in every old boxcar. I rode down every railroad line. Now I don't have to boast. I rode coast to coast. Now I'm riding on that old westbound. Let the jungle fires burn wild and free and pass my bottle around. Let the train whistle blow. Tell the old boats I'm a riding on the westbound. Light a candle at the back of my boxcar and gather my good friends around. Let the old banjo wing while the hobos all sing. I'm a riding on the westbound. Let the jungle fires burn wild and free and pass my bottle around. Let the train whistle blow. Tell the old boats I'm a riding on the westbound. Lay me down on a blanket of cardboard. Use my bindle to pillow my head. And when my body's gone, my spirit will ride on, riding on that old westbound. A young hobo hopped off a boxcar. Just outside of town, he found a quiet little jungle where he could lay his bindle down. He grabbed some dry firewood to brighten up the night. But when he struck his match, he saw an awful eerie sight. For well, the campfire glowed and sparkled with a brilliant rainbow flame flickering and dancing like the headlight of a fast westbound train. When out of the smoke and cinders and through the fiery air came the ghosts of some old hobos he thought he met somewhere. He came, shook his hand, and offered up a spot or two, and then they started boiling up a friendly stew. Their calm and easy manner finally calmed that young boast right. He asked if they could jungle up together and spend the lonesome night. Each of us caught the westbound, one bow said with a tear. But we all come back to Pennsburg, if only once a year. In the third week of September, when fall is almost near, we hobo out of heaven, and we jungle up right here. You see, this old jungle is a mighty sacred spot where hobos came year after year, camped on this very lot. It was one of the best gatherings that you could ever find where hobos were respected and treated oh so fine. Well, the moon started yawning, for it was almost dawn. The bows made up their packs, and they said they'd be moving on. Then there was a mighty whistle, and the campfire filled with steam, and all the hobos vanished like it was just a crazy dream. The young bow sat bewildered. He said, how could this really be? Is it something I've been drinking, or is my mind just fooling me? Then he looked into the fire, and what he saw he could not explain, for there were his hobo buddies riding on a fiery train. The train sounded one last whistle, and his hobo pals waved so long. Then a magic wind blew the flames out, and the camp firelight was gone. Young Bo packed his spindle. He walked down to the track. He hopped inside a boxcar, but he knew that he'd be back. For the magic in Pennsburg's campfire still lives in all the hearts of every bow who went there and camped beneath the stars. And someday in the future, when all of us are gone, a space age traveler will light the fire and the legend will live on. Let the jungle fires burn wild and free and pass my bottle around. Let the train whistle blow. Tell the old bows I'm a riding on the westbound. I'm a riding on the westbound. I'm a riding on the westbound. Now, we're talking about some songwriting. And uh, earlier, earlier on, uh, when I was doing the TV shows, we talked about, you know, when you write a song, 
how does that come about? You know, and sometimes it's one of those things that comes out really easily. You know, you're just writing it almost like an exercise for writing. And other times it's almost like what they say, the muse visits you. And when that happens, something kind of possesses you and takes over and your pen just moves. And this, this, uh, this song I'm gonna share with you, it's one of those songs that's like that. It happened long ago, it was on a Father's Day that my friends were all excited. They were saying, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm going fishing with my dad. I'm gonna call up my, my dad and, I, and we're, we're gonna get together. Oh, we, we have a, always have a good time together. Well, I didn't have a good relationship with my father. So the idea of Father's Day was not something I looked forward to. And uh, I decided that it was time to do something about it because I realized that it went deeper than just the fact of me and my father. I realized that my father and his father had a problem. And stories about grandpa had a problem. And I realized that I was part of this big chain, this chain of confusion. And I thought it was time to sever that chain. So I went down and I went into the quiet part of the basement and I grabbed a pencil and I started writing a song. A friend came by at the time and said, uh, that's an interesting song, Rick. I said, yeah, I, I wrote it for my father. He said, are you gonna sing it for your dad? I said, well, I guess I should, shouldn't I? Well, the next holiday came by and everybody was meeting at grandma's house. My Polish grandmother was making up the kabasi and the guwampi and everybody was working away at making the big meal. And I said, uh, dad, uh, I have something I want to share with you. I know, well, he saw the guitar. He wasn't paying any attention. Nobody's paying any attention. I said, wait a minute, Dad. This is different. This, I'm not just singing you a, a song. I said, I'm writing. I wrote this song for you, Dad. And at that, everyone, everyone was quiet. Everybody sat down. And I picked up the guitar. My father and me would never agree. Fussing and fighting since the day I was three. A giant of steel who just couldn't feel how to show his son his love. Now the hardest thing for a father to do isn't swinging an ax or work the night through. So open your heart you got nothing to lose and show your son your love. The autumn winds blew as the young child grew and he cursed at a man that he never knew. While doing the chores, he cursed him with scorn and never gave his father his love. Now the hardest thing for a father to do isn't swinging an axe or work the night through. So open your heart, you got nothing to lose and show your son your love. Fathers and sons, since time begun, iron-clad hearts away in a ton. Oh, shake of the hand, Slap on the back, old memories from a worn leather strap. Now the hardest thing for a father to do isn't swinging an ax or work the night through. So open your heart, you got nothing to lose and show your son your love. Now too many years have come and have passed. And the days of my childhood are out of my grasp. Now my father and I both want to cry 
thinking back on the time that we were denied. Now the hardest thing for father to do isn't swinging an ax or work the night through. So open your heart, you got nothing to lose and show your kids your love. Now, Yanko was one of the best flute players in all of Poland. Ha! When Yanko played his flute, everybody was happy. The birds flew down from the sky and landed on his shoulders. But Yanko was an old man. And as what happens with old men, one day he died. And he found himself sitting on a shooting star going high up into the galaxy. He went, ha, 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 ha and landed right at the gates of heaven. And it was dark and the gates were locked. And he sat there for a while and he picked up his flute and he started to play. Pop, 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 angels' heads popped up. They said, oh, 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 listen to him play. He plays so wonderful. Who are you? He said, oh, I'm Janko from Poland. I just got here. Janko. And all of a sudden, this angel with big fiery wings came flying in and he landed and he said, who are you? And Janko said, who are you? He said, I am St. Peter. Now, who are you? I'm Janko, just a poor flute player from Poland. He said, Janko, from Zakopane? He said, hey, that's me. He said, you're early. You're not supposed to be here yet. He said, we're fast in the highlands we are. He said, none of that, Janko. You're already causing problems, and you haven't been invited into heaven. Now, I want you to sit here and be quiet. He flew away. And Janko sat there. but he had his flute and he couldn't help himself. And he picked up and he started to play again. The angel said, oh, there he is, it's Yanko. And St. Peter said, Yanko, I thought I told you to be quiet. He said, I tried. He said, all right, all right. He reached in his wing and he took out his big golden key and he unlocked the gates of heaven and the gates of heaven swung wide open. And Yanko and St. Peter, they walked down that golden road of heaven and everywhere they went, they heard, there he is, it's Yanko, Yanko, it's Yanko, Yanko's coming. Yanko, Yanko, Yanko was going all over heaven till it reached the top man. There he was, God sitting on the front porch smoking his pipe when he heard the news about Yanko, he said, if Yanko's so good, I want you to bring him before me. So Yanko was summoned right before God. He didn't know what to do. He bowed his head. He stumbled along. He heard this voice. Yanko? <laughs> yes. From Poland? Yes. The flute player? Yes. Then he said, can you play me a song? Yanko said, of course. And he picked up his flute and he started to play like he never played before. And Yanko played and played and they danced and the angels danced and Yanko played and days went by and they danced and Yanko played and they went by and St. Cecilia came by and said, Nobody's coming to choir practice. What's going on? They said, it's Yanko. He's highlandizing heaven. We have to get rid of him. Yanko was listening. And they said, I think we're going to send him to Pluto. Yanko said, Pluto? Not even real planet. He said, wait a minute. He said, 
I didn't, I didn't want to cause any problems. I'm just a poor flute player. I'm just a musician. That's all I know how to do is play my flute. Yanko, you can't go around highlandizing heaven. We're going to send you away. We're thinking of Pluto. Yanko said, but, but maybe, maybe you could send me back, back to Earth. <laughs> yes, Yanko, we could send you back to Earth. But no one would ever see you. You would just be a spirit. He said, well, if you were going to send me back to Pluto. He said, no. He said, no, I'll be more than just a spirit. He said, when I get lonely, I'll play my flute into the river. And when the rivers flow through the valley, you'll hear my music. And when I'm feeling happy, I'll play into the wind. And when the wind blows through the trees, you'll hear my music play. And when the young girls are falling in love, I'll whisper all the old songs into their ears. And when the boys are standing at the top of the mountain, I'll make sure they know all the old fiddle tunes. He said, no, I'll never be lonely. And I will never let the old music die. So it was that Yanko sat on a star and shot high up through the galaxy and way back down into planet Earth, into the mountains of Poland, and disappeared into the mist. But some of the old Highlanders say, if you walk around in the hills and you listen when the wind blows through the trees, the rivers blow through the valleys. The young girls sing songs of love, and the young boys play their fiddle tunes at the top of the mountain. You know that Yanko is still alive in the hills of Poland. <laughs> There's so much to to share. It's kind of it's kind of hard, you know, because um, you're trying to uh, pack in like 50 years of performing, traveling all over all over the world and sharing music. And to be honest with you, folks, I never thought that um, that I would be able to do it. You know, I said, there are a lot more people talented than me. Why am I going around, traveling around, and being able to live this life? And I felt very grateful that I had this opportunity to share music with people and, and bring people together. Now, on my banjo, my mentor, Pete Seeger, had something on his banjo that said, this machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender. Well, I didn't feel that powerful. <laughs> So I have here, this machine fosters hope and brings people together because that's what I can do. And that's what I've been doing for the last 50 years. And I've been honored to be able to share music. Now, I'm gonna sing you. Do we have enough time to do two more? Okay, well this, that uh, I'm just honored that I had a chance to work with so many people and, um, and carry on this old, old tradition of telling stories. Because I believe in stories just as much as I believe in music. I believe there is a power in stories. I believe that, you know, when we die, often the only thing that's left is the story. You know what happens. We die our possessions, and a lot of them end up in a dumpster. Other ones are just squandered away. The money is gone. So what's left? What's left is the stories of who we were. And if you were a good person, there'll be stories about that. And if you were not a good person, there'll be stories about that. So I grew up with a whole family of storytellers. I didn't know that we were any different than anybody else. 
we just sat around on, that's what we did. We would tell stories all the time. And Pete Seeger was a great storyteller too. And whenever I would visit with him, he would tell me all these wonderful stories. And I think in, in a way, he was giving them to me to pass on so that you would hear these stories too. I was always fascinated by this group called the Almanac Singers that Pete, can you hear? Okay, sorry. I was always fascinated by the Almanac Singers and the Almanac Singers were a group with Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger, uh, Mill Lampell and Lee Hayes. And they went and they, they did union halls all across America in 1941 in a, in a blue 1932 Buick that was formerly owned by a gangster named Joey the Mouth. Now, I was always fascinated by that story and I decided that it would be kind of fun to recreate that tour. And I got a friend, George Mann, and we did recreate that tour. 10 years ago, we traveled 9,000 miles across the United States singing at Union Halls, just like the Almanac Singers did. There, there's the album that we did. And on the album, uh, Pete Seeger is telling the stories. I recorded him at his home telling the stories about the Almanac Singers. And one of the stories, one of my favorite stories is a story that he said uh, that happened a year before that. He said that they were out in uh, Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, singing for the oil uh, field workers. And uh, it was a small union. It was maybe about 50 or so people came in, a lot of them women and children. And they were all sitting there and Pete and Woody were singing songs. And they were singing along. And in the back, a long line of men showed up with these long trench coats. The union organizer, Bob Wood, said, Pete and Woody, you better sing another song. These men might be here to cause some problems. So they did, they sang another song. And then the big guy, the leader of the group, he stepped forward and he opened up his overcoat and there was a baseball bat sewn in the inside. And he said, the boss sent me here to break up this union meeting. But after hearing you boys sing, I realized you're just like us. You're just workers, just like us, singing songs for people like us. I'm gonna go back and tell the boss that nothing happened here today. He said, but the next time I come back, you better have an American flag on that podium. And they left. Well, Ina Wood came over and she said to Woody Guthrie, she said, Woody, you're always writing songs about men. Fellow workers this, fellow workers that. When you're gonna write a song for the union women, if it wasn't for the union women, there might've been some real problems here. Well, Woody huffed and he puffed and he went over into the, the uh, union office and he sat there, he had a big, big jar of wine. And uh, he had uh, his tape typewriter and he's pecking away, trying out a line. And then uh, Pete got tired. He went to sleep. He woke up and there was Woody Guthrie curled up like a cat on the floor. A bottle of wine completely empty and a song sitting on the typewriter. There once was a union mate who never was afraid. All the goons and ginks and company thinks Deputy sheriffs that made the raid She went to the union hall When the meeting it was called And when the company of boys came round She always stood her ground Oh, you can't scare me I'm sticking to the union I'm sticking to the union I'm sticking to the union Oh, you can't scare me I'm sticking to the union I'm sticking to the union Till the day I die. This union maid was wise to the tricks of the company spies, and she wouldn't be fooled by the company stole. She always organized the guys, she always got her way. When she struck for higher pay, she'd just show her card to the National Guard. This is what she'd say Oh, you can't scare me, I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me, I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. 
till the day I die. Try it with me. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union till the day I die. This is, yeah, let me just do this one song for all you folks, okay? So I wrote this song on my 50th birthday. And I did what any 50-year-old would do at the time. I went and I called my friend, Tony, who was turning 60. And I said, hey, Tony, you're getting old. He said, old man, I'm not old. I'm still riding my Harley Davidson motorcycle. In fact, I put a patch on the back of my jacket. It said, too old to die young. I said, hmm, that's an interesting line. He said, why don't you write a song about it, Rick? So I started this idea of writing this song. And it was just for fun at first. And uh, it ended up, the first time it got played on the radio was on NPR on Car Talk. You remember Click and Clack? It was the first time it debuted. I'm driving down the highway looking for a little thrill, racing with my friends in my Pontiac Bonneville. Don't wear a seatbelt, don't give a damn. Driving into Nashville from Alabama. Young folks say I'm having too much fun. Just too old to still die young. I'm just too old to still die young. Just too old. Try it. Just too old to still die young, just too old to still die young. I'm a hillbilly rebel yelling son of a gun, and I'm just too old to still die young. I love my Harley, still love my whiskey. Life ain't for living if you're not being risky. Don't eat quiche, man, I ain't no sissy. Sleeping in a boxcar from Maine to Mississippi, young folks say I'm having too much fun. Just too old to still die young, just too old to still die young. I'm just too old to still die young. I'm a hillbilly rebel yelling son of a gun. I'm just too old to still die young. I wake when the sun rise, eat lots of french fries, work like a damn fool. Yell if I want to, move like a jaguar, run like a NASCAR, drink like an old clown, sleep when I fall down. Young folks say I'm having too much fun. Just too old to still die young. Just too old to still die young. I'm just too old to still die young. I'm a hillbilly rebel yelling son of a gun, and I'm just too old to still die young. I say the good, die too soon, but I'm still here, shooting the moon. There may be snow on the top of my head, but I ain't laying down till I find me dead. No, no. I'm driving down the highway, looking for a little thrill, racing with my friends in my Pontiac Bonneville. Don't wear a seatbelt, don't give a damn. Driving into Nashville from Alabama. Young folks say I'm having too much fun. Just too old to still die young. Help me, just too old to still die young. I'm just too old to still die young. I'm a hillbilly rebel yelling son of a gun, and I'm just too old to still die young. I'm a hillbilly rebel yelling son of a gun, and I'm just too old to still die young. Thank you, folks.